Hi everyone, Ballister Boldheart here with Rhyme Signatures, the nerdiest music review this side of being the best lead character in the best animated film of the year that no one is talking about, for shame. And today we're going to be doing a review of the new Lars Frederik Freusli album, Fire for Tellinger. Yeah, I know, I know, I'm late on this one, it's been out for over a month. The skies are burning, the seas are boiling, and I've missed the inevitable hype train for this video to get any clicks. Yada 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 yada. Look, I don't care, okay? I take my time if I need to, and I do these videos for me. You guys know that. But anyway, enough of my ceaseless whittering. It's time once again for Norway to lumber up to the podium and take a few body shots at the rest of the world, as we are once again, for the umpteenth time this year, being reminded of why this country is one of the best in the world for modern prog. Lars Frederick Freusli, or Lars as he shall be for the remainder of the video to spare me the embarrassment of trying to pronounce a surname that includes a letter with an accent in it, is better known as the keyboard player for symphonic prog veterans Wobbler. And man, does that band ever have some serious pedigree to them. If you were to look at prog archives and you checked out the top 100 progressive rock albums of all time, you'll notice that apart from the fact that the top 10 is absolutely stacked and hard to argue against, you'll see a distinct lack of anything released in the 2010s in this list, unless your name happens to rhyme with Weaven Stilson, of course. But lo and behold, there are two Wobbler albums in this list, and both of these came out after 2015, an era far, far away from the classic period of 69 to 79. So honestly, for anything to come out of Camp Wobbler, especially from someone as creative and knowledgeable with his craft as Lars is, it's gonna set off the prog rock alarm bells and immediately demand the attention of the community. And I am pleased to say that the hype is met. The legacy and reputation of Wobbler carries over beautifully into this incredibly comfortable, grandiose labour of love. Fire for Tellinger is an exceptional example of just how alive and well the classic sounds can be in 2023, and proves that if you love something enough, you'll make it work in any context. This record feels like it was plucked out of time, even more so than a typical Wobbler album, which, you know, they felt nostalgic enough as they were. Fire for Tellinger is Lars showcasing just how to make an album that feels like it's 50 years old in the best way. There is so much old blood on display here. The sounds of Gentle Giant, Van de Graaff Generator, Yes, ELP, Genesis, Camel. It's all here and all accounted for, and a lot of this is down to the fact that Lars has basically brought a museum's worth of classic keyboards to bear on this album. As you would expect from a solo album from the band's keyboard player, this is very much the forefront of the sounds on offer here, and is what helps this to stand out a bit more than just being a Wobbler album under a different name. The keys are the star, and what shining examples of what you can do with them this album is. Think of a classic prog sound. Go on, think of one. It's on here. It's done incredibly. It sounds exactly like how they used to. I could play this next to some of my first pressing Yes or Genesis finals, and this album would sound eerily similar to them despite the 50 years between their recording dates. And it's not just the sounds that are familiar. This is structured in such a similar way too, you know. You've got these big 15 minute plus epics at the start and at the end, with the smaller, hookier, more immediate tracks in between. Four tracks in all, and easily made in such a way that it's two tracks to each side of the vinyl pressing. It's just so remarkable to me how much attention has been paid, how much the minutiae of how albums like this used to be made has been translated onto Fire for Tellinger, that it really does speak to an artist who's crafted this as a love letter to the music that made them who they are today. And you feel this love, you feel this respect and admiration for the classics on every single second of this album's runtime. I will be honest though, going into this album I was expecting, and fearing if I'm being brutally honest, there to be a largely, I don't know, jam session nature to the music, if that makes any sense. I was anticipating there to be largely freeform, structuralist music with little emphasis on things like leitmotifs, strong melodies, or otherwise more solidly formed musicality. I don't even know why, I just had a vibe on the lead up to this record that that was going to be the deal. If anything though, this record is bizarrely catchy, and I found myself absent-mindedly humming many of the principal melodies from it over the past few days. 
Opening track, and you'll excuse my pronunciation, I'm sure, Ritter ad Domadag rolls into its first of many infectiously memorable grooves nice and easily with the smoothness of a well-aged bourbon. Lars sings exclusively in his native Norwegian throughout the album, so I'm afraid the nuance of the lyrics will be a little bit lost on me. I speak Swedish, not Norwegian. But I can confirm that his gentle, comforting tone fits the music perfectly. He is not a showy or bombastic vocalist, but does an admirable job all the same at keeping pace with the style and mood of his extensive keyboard work. There's a strong vibe of Emerson, Lake and Palmer on this track, and it's an excellent showcase of precisely what this project is all about. I'm a particularly big fan of when the epic, swelling, almost dirge-like main keyboard riff is revisited towards the end of the track, bringing a great feeling of circularity and closure to the song. The two shorter tracks of Et Sted Under Himhelvet and Jertigen do a great job at offering some more immediate punches to the album, showing off Lars's more frenetic and engaging songwriting as the massive slow burn soundscapes of the opener are left behind in favour of a more direct and front-loaded approach. There's a brilliant use of harpsichord, and Nikolai Hengsel really earns his chops as the only guest musician on the album with his work on the bass, which is especially toothsome and satisfying on these offerings. It's nice that we have these two tracks to round things off, as while I am obviously a big fan of longer form tracks, there are times that when an album is formed of nothing but these, it honestly makes me not want to listen to it as much, as it always feels like a huge time investment, you know, I don't feel I can pause the music or walk away until the next track starts. So having these briefer moments on the album really helps to break things up a bit and helps to make the record, you know, much more digestible overall. I do marginally prefer Jertgitten of these two tracks. I'm especially fond of the almost rhubarb and custard sounding keyboards in the opening moments. Non-Brits, you'll have to take my word for that or look it up. And this feels like the more aggressive and high tempo of the two tracks. So honestly, it's not really that surprising that I prefer this one given my usual appetites for music. That's not to say that this is a high octane thrill ride, as it does come back down to earth quite often. And once again, the harpsichord is used to great effect. More bands to use this instrument, please. Criminally underrated, and I need more of it in my life, please and thank you. This leaves us with the final offering of Naturin's Cathedral, and this is easily my favourite track on the album. The sleazy, drawn out and swaggering vibes of the opening few minutes give off the mood of a dark and dirty jazz nightclub in a dodgy part of the most noir era of prohibition cities, and I adore it. It's such a thick and palpable atmosphere that I can't get enough of. This continues into the song for the first quarter or so, before the thick and chunky keyboard riffs of the good old days come roaring back to life, and the song takes on a more ethereal mood and theme. There's a great sense of airiness and space to the midway point on this track, and it helps to lift off the heavy atmospherics of the earlier minutes. Where I really, you know, click with this track, though, is towards the latter half, when the song does get considerably more aggressive and starts to flirt with these Opethian-sounding keyboards as the tempo and griminess rises substantially. It's got the energy of Deep Purple with the sensibilities of ELP, and it's such an incredible part of the album. But then we slow right back down into what can only really be described as like a progressive Black Sabbath, as Lars flirts with these big, booming, proto-doom metal sounding waves of musicality. It's absolutely fantastic and showcases just how much creativity Lars has been able to get away with on this record, while still having everything sound both coherent and on theme. So, what are the downsides to this record? Well. If you don't like old school progressive rock, then this album isn't exactly going to change your mind. It comes with all the pomp, melodrama and self-indulgence that has plagued the reputation of the genre since the earliest days. It's complex and honestly quite inaccessible to anyone who's not already au fait with old school prog rock. This is most assuredly not making any new fans, and as a result can make the record feel, I don't know, a little hostile and insular. I mean, for me, it's great, but I can absolutely understand why someone on the outside or peripheral to progressive rock would not enjoy this one at all. So, what else can I say about Lars Frederick Freusley's Fire Foretellinger? As far as nostalgic throwbacks go, it's going to be hard to do better than this one in 2023. There's a lot of love and attention to detail in this album from a man who clearly knows his stuff and has clearly been raised on nothing but the finest examples of classic prog. No, this isn't an album for the masses, and 
I'm pretty sure Lars knows he's not going to be breaking into the top 40 anytime soon with this kind of record. But there's a self-awareness throughout the album that speaks of a man who knows that he's making this for people who miss the days of bands with 17 keyboards on stage, 12-minute drum solos, and the lead singer dressing up like a rhododendron. Recommendation is kind twofold on this one. If you're a fan of 70s era prog rock, then definitely get a physical copy of this, and definitely get it on vinyl, as it absolutely feels like this is how the album is supposed to be enjoyed. If you're not as keen, obviously give it a stream first, but I think regardless, Lars deserves to be supported with this album, so a digital copy is always appreciated as well. This is all, of course, guys, my opinion, as you know, so if you have listened to Fire for Telling Her, please tell me what you thought about the record in the comments down below. If you did like this video, please do share it around with anyone else you think would possibly enjoy it, and please do consider subscribing to the channel for more content. If you especially like what I do, please do consider clicking my coffee link in the description box down below to help support the channel. And until next time, guys, as always, keep your rhyme signatures odd.